Welcome to 3ABN's Camp Meeting 2014, The Second Coming, an in-depth look. Well, welcome back, and we are having a really blessed time here at uh, West Frankfort, Illinois, at the 3ABN Worship Center. And we're so happy that each one of you could be here with us. And uh, I just hope that you, if you're within driving distance and you can join us for the weekend, come right along. Uh, and this place is going to be packed out Sabbath. We're looking to see if we can find a few extra chairs, in fact, maybe to put over here. And uh, we're just having a really uh, wonderful time in the Lord as we study about the second coming. And it's so encouraging as we look at all the things the Bible says about Jesus coming again. And tonight, um, we're going to appreciate Pastor John Lomacain's uh, message on the signs of his coming. That we see certain signs that are just unmistakable that Christ is coming soon. Pastor John is the pastor of the Thompsonville Seventh day Adventist Church that meets here in the worship center. And uh, he has been ordained for over 20 years. We all know that he's a well known Christian recording artist and uh, has many. CDs that, uh, with all the beautiful music that John has. He sang with the Heritage Singers for years. Amazing facts. It is written. Uh, he has been all over the world. 31 countries John has traveled sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He also is the host of Sharper Focus here every Wednesday night. And he's co-host of 3ABN's House Calls, which is one of our more popular uh, programs. And so we're going to have Pastor John come and uh, speak to us. But before he does, our good friend Tim Parton is going to sing for us and play God. He's been good. winding road to the old familiar markers of all the mercies I have known I know it may sound simple but it's more than a cliche for there's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life and I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could for through it all God's been good The times replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears You see I've had more gains than losses and I've known more joy than hurt as His grace rolled down upon me so undeserved for God's been good in my life and I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night and though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could for through it all my God's been good 
For you see, God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. And His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. Now I could spend forever trying to tell you everything. But the best way that I can say it is simply this. I'm sure that you agree. God's been good in my life. And I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been so Thank you, Tim. Amen to that song. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we need to know that in these last days, we serve a God who is good all the time. You've spoken to our hearts, you've anointed our lips, and Lord, I ask you now to do what you do best, and that is to Speak to your people and prepare our hearts for your soon return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. They've given me the message, the signs of his return. Well, I'd like to give it a subtitle. I refer to it as the not so often considered signs. I'd like to begin with a scripture in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. If you don't have your Bibles, it will appear on the screen. The not-so-often-considered signs, Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 32. The Bible says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. We are living in the generation that will be judged not for the decline of its real estate, but for the decline of its moral state. We are living at a time where the agenda of a nation has become the corruption of its inhabitants. We have arrived at an hour where the only thing of lesser value than the dollar is the value of human life. And the reason is the world has blinded itself to the evidence of Christ's soon return. Tonight, based on what I see, I know that Jesus is soon to come. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The evidences are clear around us. And so tonight I could summarize the message by saying the five not-so-often-considered signs of the second coming of Jesus. Sign number one, the rejection of evidence. The rejection of evidence. Now here in southern Illinois, we know that the summer is coming because the evidence is abundant. In the very same way, I know that Jesus is coming because the evidence is abundant. One of the signs that the Apostle Peter made very clear about the days in which we live, the days just before the coming of Jesus, he said, consider the temperature of the climate. If the people of God are students of the Word, it is impossible to miss the idea that we are living in the last days. Can you say amen to that? 
Peter said, in the last days, people really would not believe that Jesus is coming. Notice his words in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and verses 4. He says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the what days, church? In the last days, walking according to their own lusts or desires, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, he says, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, you know, if you've been around half as long as I have, you know that things have changed. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I'm in the 50s. <laughs> I'm still the speed limit in some states. <laughs> Not in Arkansas. My wife and I just got back from Arkansas at 75 miles an hour there. Oh, would they get that kind of wisdom in Illinois. <laughs> but I'm still the speed limit in some states. But if you look at the temperature and the horizon of the society in which we live, if you look at what's happening on the daily news broadcasts, if you listen to the news that come across our screen from night to night and read your Bible and study the newspapers, if you simply daily Take the temperature of the world around us. Everyone knows that this world cannot last longer than it has. It cannot sustain itself. Like one of my favorite preachers said, the world is like an old pair of jeans that have been tearing on one section and tearing on the other, and pretty soon you can't stitch it together anymore. You just have to throw it away. Well, this world is beyond stitching together. God is going to give us a new heaven and a new earth. But Peter made it clear the reason why the world is the way it is. He said, they willingly forget that Jesus is coming again. How can you forget when 24 hours a day, 3ABN is dedicated to proclaiming to the world an undiluted three angels' messages, but I didn't stop yet, one that will counteract the counterfeit. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Because Jesus hasn't returned yet does not mean that he's not coming. The writer of Hebrews said these words, and I, I commit them to my memory when I look at how bad things get. You know, sometimes you look at the news, and my wife and I, when we stand there and look at the 6 o'clock news, or sometimes just before we go to bed, we turn to CNN. Now, some of our members don't have television. That's their choice. But I need to remain informed. I need to know when I come to church on Sabbath morning that I'm aware of the condition of the world so I can inform those who may have been at ease in Jerusalem. But the writer of Hebrews says this about the coming of Jesus. He says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come, say the next two words together, will come and will not tarry. The good news tonight is Jesus is not canceling his second coming. But just like 9-11, the world is comforted with false reports. Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 6 and verse 14 says, they have also healed the hurt of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. There is no peace. The Pope is trying to get peace around the world. He's busy traveling to different countries and different denominations. He recently had a meeting with the Jews and the Muslims talking about the areas that they have in common, trying to find a way for mutual respect to exist between the denominations. But the only platform of unity, I'm going to say tonight, is Jesus and his truth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I could have mutual respect for your position as another Christian, but the only platform by which we can be honestly unified is by a thus saith the Lord. But this pope is busy. And if you're not aware of it, this is one of the only popes that we've had. Matter of fact, I believe it's the only one we've had that is a Jesuit. And all you got to do is read the Jesuit oath to know that he may appear to be lamb-like on the exterior. But if you listen to what he's saying, the dragon is reflecting every now and then through the things that he is saying. Apparently, there seems to be statements of peace. But when you say that you're not really openly condemning the condition of Christians that enter into the ministry, and you'll understand what I mean in just a few moments. When you appear and say that it doesn't really matter what you believe, but we're going to all go to heaven anyhow, you know that that's not from God's Word. What do you say? Yes. 
And so this, this man that, as they said on CNN, they said, we may not agree with his doctrinal position, but we just love him so much. I've heard the best way to kick down a door is with a feather. And he's doing a very effective job by letting his agenda be known by sweet, soft tones, but you've got to read the Bible to understand that God made it very clear that the last kingdom that will reign on this earth is the kingdom of Rome. The Bible says it will trample down and break the residue under its feet. Rome is serious about its prophetic place in history. Its, its nature has not changed. And tonight I'm going to preach a very unpopular message. But I believe that God's people that are listening to the message, God's people in other denominations need to hear the truth of God's Word so that they can be aware that Jesus is coming and that prophecy is sure. Amen. In the book Evangelism, page 704, Ellen White says this. She says, angels are now restraining the winds of strife until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, she says, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. That's happening even right now. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I mean, if you travel around the world, as my wife and I, Pastor Jim Gilly, bless his heart, he had my old bio. It's not been 31 countries, it's 52 now. And we have been to places where people say, they don't even hear sermons about the second coming of Jesus anymore. I remember standing up and hearing an aged preacher say, he says, I can't think of the day, I can't think of the last time that I heard a sermon about the second coming of Jesus preach from the pulpit of the church that I attend. And I would wish to say that was a different denomination, but unfortunately it was an Adventist church. It is too late for us to adopt the gospel of another movement We've been called to preach an undiluted end times message. What do you say? Yes. A lot of people want to be liked. God has not called preachers to be liked. God has called us to give the trumpet a certain sound. Yes. And I've said a number of times, and I reiterate this again tonight, I'm going to make sure that when Jesus comes, I've preached what I've found in his word so that the only blood that I have to answer for is my own blood. Can you say amen to that? I said to somebody once before, I'm going to say it so clear that your blood will not be on my head. But if you look at the world today, the conditions of our world are parallel to those of the days of Noah. This world is ripe for the second coming of Jesus. Notice the commentary from Genesis chapter 6 and verse 11. The Bible talks about that day, the world that existed just before Jesus destroyed the world. The Bible says, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was, together, filled with violence. Pastor John Bradshaw talked about the two 12-year-old girls that were so caught up in this fictitious world of Slender Man that they tried to take the life of one of their friends. Sometimes you got to turn the news off because it's so bad, it's so sad, that you got to go back to the Word of God to find that there is still some good news in these last days. But I was, I was moved by the story. I saw the video. I couldn't help. They talked about this on CNN, about this young man, this 22-year-old Santa Barbara college student that methodically planned a shooting spree because he was rejected by young ladies. He said that, he said, and I quote, if I had it in my power, I would stop at nothing to reduce every one of you to mountains of skulls and rivers of blood. That's the kind of world we live in. Genesis 6 and verse 5 makes it clear that the world that we live in is just like the world in Noah's day. The commentary says, then the, law saw, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was what? Great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil, how often? Continually. You even got to watch, you've got to be careful what you watch. Shows nowadays, they, they teach you how to be vengeful. Shows like revenge. When God says, vengeance is mine. You can't watch a show like that and not start becoming vengeful. Can you say amen to that? You can't watch some of these shows like, uh, they, they call it the new normal or modern family. You cannot watch 
what the producers that are motivated by a satanic power from beneath are producing and expect your mind to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. In conflict and courage, Ellen White says we are living in an age, in an evil age. She says the perils of the last days thicken around us. And the reason is given clear, because iniquity abounds, the love of many does what? Waxes cold. Then Paul the Apostle gives us also a snapshot of the gathering storm. He says, and this is amazing, when I read this, I thought to myself, if Paul the Apostle was alive today, he would be amazed at how accurate the Spirit of God gave him a description of the days in which we live. This is amazingly accurate about the conditions of our world today. And it says to us that the only way that you can be unprepared for the coming of Christ is if you ignore the evidence. Notice what he says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. This know also, he says, that in the last days, what kind of times, church? Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's happening today. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Lord, have mercy for the parents today. I got to pause here and just say something. I know Will will bring the slide back. I was, in, I was in Walmart one day, and I was watching a kid really take his mother to task. And uh, her, her, it appeared as though she did not want to embarrass her kid in public. And I thought, my mother was different. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? My mother was different. She'd embarrass you in public and then embarrass you back home in private. Come on, say Amen. I was raised in the day where the neighbor would whip you, tell your mother she would whip you, and then she'd say, wait till Papa come home and he'll whip you. <laughs> I went to school when, I don't want to say this too much, but uh, Yvonne Lewis, Dr. Yvonne Lewis, her father was my principal. And uh, I can tell you, he knows how to swing a really good whip. <laughs> Whenever I visit with him in the care home there in, in West Frankfurt, I remember one day when he saw me, he said, I'm Loma King. He said, I want you to know I own some of that success. Unashamedly, he said that. <laughs> but I never forget the day when Mr. Hodge called me. He, he said it so nicely. He said to me, because I, 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 I don't know what I did. I think I brought, I brought the wrong book report to school, or I put the wrong cover on it. And he said, he didn't say, I'm going to whip you. He said, Loma Cain, we've got to talk. And he didn't say a word. The whip said it all. <laughs> but the problem with our world today is that our modern culture has taken the ability to discipline our children out of our hands. Amen. And I'm not talking about child abuse. I'm talking about balanced discipline. I'm talking about when I was raised, I remember very well, I, I, I disobeyed my mother and she taught me well. And I've discovered that punishment works a whole lot better than sometimes a spanking does. I said what I should not have said to her. And when my birthday came, I sat in my bedroom and I watched all the kids in the kitchen blowing out my candles, eating my birthday cake. And nowadays, children will take their, their parents to task. Nowadays, you hit a child, they'll call the police on you. They walk around with their lawyer's card in their top pocket. I remember my sister and her daughter one day, her daughter was getting on her. She's up in her 30s now, but one day her daughter was getting beside herself, and, and she said, if you hit me, I'll call the police. She said, no, I'll call them for you. <laughs> she forgot that her mother works for the police department. <laughs> so she did. She called the police, and she said, now, I want you to tell her that if she starts mounting off in this apartment, I'm going to kick her out and I'll have y'all come and get her to move our stuff out. Well, she's still with her mom to this day. <laughs> but the Bible says disobedient to parents. We cannot over underestimate that. Children are disobedient in so many avenues. It's amazing today that people that don't raise children are saying that the only thing you need to do is counsel a child, but the Bible says the rod of correction will drive all that disobedience far from them. Not only that, unthankful, go back to the slide, unholy. Without natural affection, the Bible says, truce breakers cannot keep a promise, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, the Bible says, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 
The reason is clear, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, the Bible says, turn away. The only assurance we have in these last days, I would say, is unwavering faith in Jesus. You've got to look at the signs. You cannot ignore the signs. The signs are thick around us, as God's messenger says. They are everywhere. All you've got to do is open your eyes, and based on the signs, I know that Jesus is soon to come. That's sign number one. But look at sign number two. Legislated immorality. Legislated immorality. In Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 28, notice what the Bible says to us in these last days. It says, likewise as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, the Bible says, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, I don't want to be a bearer of bad news, but I want to say, based on what I see, another destruction is coming. Can I, can I talk tonight? Can I be clear? The human heart has been immoral since the fall of man, but we live in a world today that, that exalts sexual depravity. Can I be clear tonight? One of the signs that we are living in the time of the end is modern society applauds things that animals that we call dumb won't do. Now, you told me to be clear. I'm going to be clear. Luke 17, verse 30 talks about this condition. It says, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I had to get this text Amplified, and I began to do some research to find out how this applies, how the church has been affected in the last days by the conditions of the city that Lot lived in, the city of Sodom. We are living not in a city of Sodom. We are living in a world of Sodom. Amen. And it's becoming increasingly illegal to speak against it. Amen. I told my good friend John Dinsey, who's the head of 3ABN Latino, I said to him one day at, at fellowship lunch, and I said, Now, John, you want to share a jail cell with me? And he looked and said, huh? <laughs> what do you mean? And I said, when it becomes illegal to preach the truth, I'm still going to preach the truth. I guess you don't want me to do that. <laughs> because it's illegal in some countries to speak against immorality. It's illegal in some places that are getting very close to us to speak against all these sexual immoralities that are beginning to wrap our globe in a dark curtain of the last days. But I was not aware of how much the church had been affected by it. Listen to this. In the United States, the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Episcopal Church have both approved rules to ordain openly gay and lesbian clergy. Is that an oxymoron? That's just the beginning. In 2009, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America decided, as of 2009, to accept gay clergy in sexually active monogamous relationships. So in other words, if a man is with a man, as long as he's just with one man, it's okay. That's what they may say, but that's not in God's Word. Can I get an amen somewhere? <laughs> In 2011, that same church in Canada decided to accept gay clergy in sexually active monogamous relationships. And right now, somebody told me they were listening to 3ABN in Canada. They said, good thing we could get it by earways because you can't come to Canada and preach that message. You get thrown in jail. I heard about one of our clergy out west that lost his job because on a Sabbath morning when he was preaching, he made it clear from God's Word, and he, you, you can't even preach in the pulpit. You might get fired from your secular job. But that's all right. Our Lord will provide. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. But Paul the Apostle makes it reason, 
makes it very clear why this condition exists. But notice God's response to those things that are exalted in the eyes of humanity. Notice Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Here are the words of God. Here's what he says. For this reason, the Bible says, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. No matter how popular it gets, God does not approve it. What do you say? But I made up my mind if rejecting the LGBT agenda brings persecution, I'd rather be persecuted by man than prosecuted by God. Come on, somebody. If speaking out against prevailing immorality brings persecution, I'd rather be persecuted by man than prosecuted by God. Amen. If preaching the truth brings persecution, I'd rather be persecuted by man than prosecuted by God. And I want to make something very clear. I don't preach this in a judgmental way. Because I've got family members in the same category. Somebody once said to me, you don't understand. I said, oh, I understand what I'm preaching. I want to say tonight very clearly, God loves homosexuals, but God does not like at all, at all, homosexuality. Come on, somebody, help me out. Amen. We've got to lift up our voice like a trumpet and show the people their transgression, but show them Jesus is still the answer of deliverance from any sin. But the problem is in America, we've made this sin so unique for so long that now it wants its own special category. I've said, why don't we have special categories? Why don't, we have, why don't we have support groups in our churches for people that drink alcohol? We got those. They call them AA. But we don't speak to those individuals and say, just keep on drinking for the rest of your lives. We say there is deliverance from alcohol. Come on, somebody, help me out. To that, nowadays, it's not about deliverance. It's about, it's about, it's about acceptance. It's about hear my story, but leave me alone. We got to preach against darkness, but we got to hold up Jesus as the light and the answer for deliverance. What do you say? Amen. That's why I don't support traditional marriage. I don't support it. I do not support traditional marriage. After 31 years of marriage, I don't support traditional marriage. Just don't cut off the TV until I'm done. I support biblical marriage. Come on, help me out, somebody. Amen. Traditions change, but God's Word never changes. Amen. So when they start talking about traditional marriage, well, the problem with our world is tradition. In vain, the Bible says, do they worship me by their tradition. I don't do what I do because it's traditional. I do what I do because it's scriptural. Can you say amen to that? Amen. God never intended for sex to be between a man and a woman either. Don't worry about it. Just keep your pacemaker going. <laughs> God never intended for sex to be just between a man and a woman. God intended for sex to be between a husband and a wife. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. We got this thing all mixed up. We think that, well, she's a woman, I'm a man, that's okay. And the problem nowadays is we have, exalt, we have so embraced this immoral world of sexual deviation that nowadays people don't even talk about adultery anymore. It's like, it's, the, it's like a normal sin. This guy that spoke out on the L.A. Clippers, Los Angeles Clippers, for this racial remark, they ignored the fact that he was in an adulterous relationship. They made more no noise about his racial mark than the life he was living. And that's what the problem is nowadays. So many people living immorally, they just pick the thing they want to amplify. But in God's words, you cannot pick and choose what you amplify. God amplifies it all. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Which brings me to my third sign. Orchestrated degradation. Orchestrated degradation. John chapter 3, verse 19. Notice what the Bible says about this orchestrated degradation. The Bible says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were what? Evil. 
were evil. Now, if we just turn the lights off in here for a brief moment, don't do it. But if we turned the lights off and this room was absolutely dark, you couldn't see things right away. You know why? Because your eyes take time to adjust to the darkness. But the fact of the matter is the world has turned the light of God's Word off for so long that their eyes are now adjusted to the darkness. Let me tell you something. Don't let your eyes get adjusted to the darkness. Come on, somebody, help me out. Because if you're in darkness long enough, you start seeing things that ain't really there. Am I right? This world is orchestrating it so that our eyes can get adjusted to the darkness. And when you speak against darkness nowadays, it's very unpopular. I mean, look at some of these television preachers. That's why I'm so glad that 3ABN is in the mix. Come on, help me out, somebody. Amen. You want to hear it like it is, you tune to this network. The undiluted. It's too late to dilute anything. But there are those nowadays that preach social, you know, the social gospel and the prosperity gospel and, you know, relationship gospel. That's all well and good, but that, if that's all you got, that's not going to get you ready for the coming of the Lord because you can preach in the Word of God as the Bible said, and we just read the text, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You got to tell the truth. Come on, you got to tell the truth, right? But Hollywood's plans today is to get our eyes adjusted to the darkness. Look at Isaiah 60 and verse 2. The Bible talks about the condition in the last days. Isaiah 60 and verse 2, notice what it says. For behold, the darkness covers the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. God wants sons and daughters that are willing to reflect to the world the glory of God as revealed in His Word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. The glory of God. All you got to do nowadays to be unusual is don't, don't, use a, don't put a tattoo on your skin. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. All you got to do nowadays to be weird is don't put a hole in your ear. I feel bad sometimes I go to the mall, I see those parents pull their kids up, baby about six months old, and they got a shooting holes in the baby's ear. And I'm thinking, they ought to pass a law that you can't do that till they're 18. Come on, help me out, somebody. <laughs> At least ask me if I want one. But nowadays, to be normal seems abnormal. And people meet you, they what kind of tattoo you got? The only tattoo I got is B.A., I'm born again. Come on, help me out. The blood of Jesus has been applied to my life. That's the only tattoo I have. Uh, but I'm going to get a tattoo in eternity because God's going to write his name on my forehead. Amen. Not literally. But he, he knows those who are his. We don't need to follow the world. We follow the world so much. The church has been impacted so much by the world that when you speak up against it, I always get people sometimes after my sermons and come up and say to me, Pastor John... I didn't like what you said, but I say like my favorite preacher, Pastor C.D. Brooks, he says, it's strange that sun could harden clay and melt butter at the same time. <laughs> it ain't the sun that's the problem, it's the condition of your life. That's why today God is calling us to be children of the light in a generation of darkness. All God wants is to have the world reflect who he really is, because this world has so misrepresented Jesus. That God wants his children to turn the light back on. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen. That's why nowadays I'm, I'm preaching from an iPad, but I want to tell you something. We've got to control our devices and do not allow our devices to control us. Amen. I've seen some young people nowadays. I saw a picture of nine young ladies standing together in a group and they put a caption over their head, social media. All nine of them were oblivious of each other because their heads were straight down. Matter of fact, I had two young ladies sit on my couch one day in, the, in my office. They were talking to each other, and one turned to the other and said, did you get that? I said, get what? She said, I just sent you a text. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a lot easier just to turn around and talk to somebody? <laughs> Amen nowadays? I mean, our devices are controlling us. And I, I put this in here. I'm going to say it. Some smartphones are turning us into dumb Christians. Come on, say amen. 
You better be smarter than your device. Nowadays, all you got to do is get your kid a computer, a cell phone, an iPad, and their own internet connection, and you won't see them for months, and they'll be just fine about that. <laughs> Come on, parents, can I get a witness somewhere? But nowadays, all you got to do is take away their cell phone. You know what they say right away? I'm bored. But the problem with that is they are so caught up by their devices that they cannot spend a thoughtful hour studying God's Word. Because things come so fast nowadays in nanoseconds and milliseconds. But God's Word is not that way. you got to spend a thoughtful hour or half an hour. you got to dig into this treasure house of values in order to find something that's lasting. But nowadays, if it can't come quickly in a nanosecond, I've got all kinds of Bibles on my iPad, but I want to tell you, nothing replaces turning the pages of God's Word. Can I get a witness, old folk? Matter of fact, I always say, if your Bible is falling apart, it belongs to someone who is not. <laughs> you also have to decide, you've got to really, by God's leading, carefully decide what real entertainment is. You've got to decide about your entertainment with eternity in view. And one of the reasons why Satan is creating all these devices, I got a call from Dish Network uh, not too long ago, and they said, can we upgrade your, v, uh, you know, your uh, digital recorder? I said, to what? They said, to the sling. I said, what's the difference? They said, you'll be able to watch television no matter where you go. I said, well, how's that? They said, well, if, if you get the sling, you can watch on, on your cell phone, you could be on the plane, you could be in the bus, you could be driving, you could watch anything you want 24 hours a day. Now, I don't know if you don't see a demonic plan in that. See, Satan is trying to give us 24-hour access to entertainment because God has already given us 24-hour access to His Word. Help me out, somebody. You got to decide which one is going to make it into the kingdom. Sling. So I decided, no, I don't need a sling. I need to get, I need to get some quiet time with the Word of God. Come on, help me out somebody. I don't need a sling. David had a sling. I didn't have a sling. I don't need a sling. <laughs> As I was putting this together, God gave me this text, Psalms 101, verse 3. Listen to this. This is definitely a last day text. Here it is. David the prophet says, or David the patriarch says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. you got to decide even what you watch because by beholding, come on, say it together, we become, we become at least impressed. But you look long enough, you become changed. That's why there are certain shows coming on television. This takes me to sign number four. I only have one more sign but this takes me to sign number four. One of the other unobvious signs of the last days is rejection of truth. Rejection of truth. Now, Pastor Bradshaw talked about wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nation, but rejection of truth. Consider this. This is the generation that supports its doctrinal beliefs based on a movie. Think about that for a moment. They began way back in the 50s when Charlton Heston came out with the Ten Commandments. Everybody thought that that was the accurate biblical account of the Ten Commandments. It's nice, it's entertaining, but you cannot formulate what, Bible, what the Bible teaches based on a movie. Help me out, somebody. Amen. You got to know for yourself. Amen. They made it look like Moses had, a, had an affair with the Pharaoh, with, with, the, with, the, with the Pharaoh's wife. Oh, you know, in the movie Ten Commandments, oh, she loved Moses. They made it look like he had some kind of secret crush on Pharaoh's... That's not in the Bible. A distortion of the character of Moses. Amen. But that's how it began. Then, even in the movie Passion, I was down in Nashville when they showed the movie The Passion to all about 6,000 pastors that are down there, uh, people from media and all these various groups. They showed The Passion. And they said that Jesus was so violently beaten that people had walked away with the idea that the reason why Jesus died is because he was beaten to death. That's not why he died. He died because of our sin. Come on, somebody say amen. You can say they beat him to death to take the guilt away from our sin. But by the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. But people look at these movies and decide, well, the reason why Jesus died, he was beaten to death. That's not scriptural. That's not sound. We've got to make our decisions about what is true based on what God's Word says. 
Not only that, this recent movie called Noah, I won't go to see it. Come on, help me out, somebody. I ain't going to see it. I got a phone call from somebody that went to see it. They said it's 5% truth and 95% lie. Made it look like Noah barely made it in the ark. Made it look like Noah had a battle with some antediluvian warriors or something like that. I don't even know. I, don't, I am not going to go see it. I haven't seen it. Come on, help me out, somebody. You cannot base what you believe on a movie. But it gets even deeper than that. Some people don't go to the movie, so the devil is bringing it to a television near you. Now ABC has a show called The Resurrection. I don't even want to ask because I ain't watching it because I know about the real resurrection. Come on, somebody. It's going to happen at the first trumpet. People ain't coming back to your house. If somebody rings your door but that look like somebody that died, you better keep the door closed <laughs> and get on your knees. Help me out. Because the Bible says, He shall not return to his house, and his place shall know him no more. Job chapter 14. He ain't coming back. But the devil now, because you know for so long I've been preaching it, and I think the devil is listening to my sermons because for so long I said, and I have a series, I said for so long nobody's talking about the resurrection. I've been saying this a couple of years now on my Sharper Focus Wednesday nights. Nobody's talking about the resurrection. The devil said, okay, I'll talk about the resurrection. So now he's got this fictitious show where after 31 years, a little boy shows up at the front door of his father. So we found your son. I saw the commercial. I ain't watching the show. <laughs> and I said, Lord, have mercy. The devil is talking about the resurrection, a fictitious representation of the resurrection. They ain't coming out until Jesus gets back. And I can tell you the movie producers are probably coming out in the second resurrection. But the devil's not done yet because we're talking about heaven and he has this new title called Heaven is for Real. And it is for real. But I want to tell you, no little boy went to heaven and just came back. Come on, help me out somebody. And that's how the devil does. He uses these little innocent faces like, oh, he can't be telling a lie. Well, he may not be telling a lie, but he's under some serious deception. Because here's the point. It's getting to the place where we're going to argue with people toe-to-toe -to -toe because they're going to say, this is my experience. And I'm going to say, but this is what the Word of God says. That's where it's headed. It's going to be experience based on God's Word. When the devil comes, it's going to be, what do you see based on what God's Word says? Because the world is getting ready for the great deception of all time, the appearing of Satan. So he's laying the foundation. And so all these things that are molding the minds and shaping people to believe whatever God's Word says, doesn't say, are going to accept with open arms when Satan shows up and looks like Christ. Jesus said, don't go out then, so I ain't going out now. Come on, help me out, somebody. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 describes the conditions. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, and here's the reason why people accept darkness, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? saved. If you don't want the truth, the devil will give you a lie. Matter of fact, it's not possible to say I love Jesus and reject the truth because Jesus and the truth are inseparable. But the devil knows that our only safeguard is to understand what the Word of God says. And so he seeks on a daily basis. He seeks on a weekly basis. He seeks on a Sabbath to Sabbath basis to separate many of us from our Bibles. That's why Seventh-day Adventists, when you go back home, if you're a Christian at all, if you're watching this program tonight, next time you go to church, you better have your sword with you. Help me out, somebody. Because you can have on a perfectly good uniform, but you go out there in the fields of Iraq or Afghanistan with a pretty uniform and say, boo, see what happens. <laughs> Devil don't care about your uniform. He don't care about your denomination either. Help me out, somebody. He don't care about what you claim to be. He don't care about what you think you believe. You better know what you believe because if Jesus needed, it is written to defeat the devil in his time of trial. Do we need it is written today? Yes. yes, we do. That's why the Lord is not looking for worshipers. He's looking for true worshipers. Anybody can worship, but God is looking for true worshipers. Notice John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Notice what the Bible says. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshiper will worship the Father in what church? Spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him, what's the next word, must worship in spirit and in truth. Satan has substitutes for everything that God has the truth for. Think about it. Sabbath, Sunday. Second coming, secret rapture. Death is the end of life. Death as an alternate route to heaven. The o- only the righteous go to heaven. Everyone goes to heaven. Have you noticed that? Everybody that dies go to heaven. Where is he? In a better place. I'm going to tell you, in New York City, the cemetery is a better place. If you want to be safe, sleep in a cemetery in a big city. Ain't nobody going to mess with you. On one side, destruction and hell. On the other side, eternal torment. The truth, the resurrection is at the second coming of Christ, but the devil is teaching the resurrection happens now. Sin on one side, but alternate lifestyle in the devil's camp. Marriage with Adam and Eve on God's side. Marriage with Adam and Steve on Satan's side. (laughs) I'm not even making light of that. Immorality, immortality on God's side. Immorality on the devil's side. And if you look at the two words, the only thing that's the difference is the cross. But Paul makes it clear, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Countless Christians are affected by error. But I got some good news. John 10, 16, Jesus said, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. What do you say? God's got folk in every denomination. That's why we've got to tell the truth. If I gave you the wrong directions, you'd be upset. But nowadays, people can lie from the Bible, and it's acceptable. If I gave you the wrong amount from your check when you came to the bank to cash it, you'd be upset, wouldn't you? If I cheated you by five cents, you'd come back to the bank. But people nowadays are lied and go back to church every week to hear another lie. That's why Tony Palmer recently said, told a conference of pastors that Doctrines don't matter. He said, God will sort out our beliefs when we get to heaven, which brings me to my last viewpoint. Sign number five, the very last one, and I'll get this done. I got five minutes, but I'm a New Yorker. (laughs) Dismantling of Protestantism. You see, the modern call to return to Rome began in 1980. Notice this article. New York Post, November 17th, 1980. Pope to Jews and Protestants. Time to heal the scars. Look at that article. Pope to Jews and Protestants, time to heal the scars. That started in 1980. So what you're hearing nowadays is the ending of that. When Tony Palmer came to Kenneth Copeland and he talked to a whole lot of Protestant leaders, a whole lot of evangelical leaders, he said, the protest is over. And if the protest is over, he said, why are you still protesting? You know why? Because it ain't over. Come on, help me out, somebody. He talked about only one thing that Martin Luther did not accept. But there are 94 others. Protest ain't over because Martin Luther does not fully speak in my behalf. God's Word speaks in my behalf. Can you say amen, church? Revelation 13, verse 14 tells us about what's happening. Revelation 13, verse 14, notice the Bible. The Bible says, and he deceived those who dwell on earth by the signs which he, has, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Rome was wounded in 1798. It has been healed, and all the world is being called back under the umbrella of Rome. Wake up! One of the unobvious signs of the last days, but look at my last quotation for the night. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451. Notice what God's God's reliable messenger, and I know by this statement that she was anointed by God. Look, Look at what it says. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, 
get this, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and together, and that the end is near. We are living in the time of the end. Say amen, somebody. If you, if you ignore all the earthquakes, which was simply the beginning of sorrow, don't ignore what's happening in Rome. Don't ignore what's happening in the evangelical world. Don't ignore what's happening with the busy itinerary of Pope. Pope John Paul, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis are sealing this thing up. And Protestants are now reaching their hands. Protestants are no longer protesting. They are embracing the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. That's what I said. And God is saying, by these things we know that the end is near. My challenge tonight is this. In this hour of descending darkness, it is time to, be, to get back to the light of God's Word. What do you say tonight? In this hour of moral corruption, it's time to get back to holiness. In this hour of rejection of truth, it's time to get back to the Word of God. In this hour of invitation to go back to Rome, it's time to get back to Jesus. What do you say? You see, I'm praying for those folk that left the church. I'm praying that some Adventists that read the great controversy will remember what they read and see what's happening around them and get back in their car and find an Adventist church somewhere, somewhere nearby. What do you say? Amen. And then those who don't know this message will see it, will read about it, will know that it's truth and find a safe harbor and a safe haven in and among the remnant church of God. What do you say? Finally, my brothers and sisters, in this hour of complacency, it is time to get ready for Jesus to come. You see, the signs are thick. They're all around us. The signs are being fulfilled in rapid succession, and I believe tonight that the final movements will be rapid ones. What do you say? Amen. They're happening. Don't fall asleep. Pay attention to the signs. Don't dismiss them. Pay attention to the signs. As you drive, pay attention to the signs. As you read God's Word, pay attention to the signs. For God's Word says, and I end with this statement, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Let us pray. Oh.